back up and I laid down on my bed and I was like, <laughs> like twitching in bed and smoke was coming out of my ears. I'm like, wait a second. God made himself? How's that possible? How don't you have to exist to create? Right? Existence presupposes all action. That was the first time I encountered a paradox. I didn't know the, know the word paradox, but I knew I'd hit this intellectual loop. And it took me many, many years after before it started to make some sense to me. But that was the beginning of my spiritual path because I knew there was something real about my existence and I knew there was something unreal about my existence. And I was trying so de desperately to reconcile the two. As a, at a very young age, I started seeing 1111s. And that's what Steve's group is called, White Light 1111. And I think there are people here who've also seen those numbers, 11s, 22s, 33s. Now, before the onset of the computer, unless you had really spiritual people around you who were in the know, you were in the dark. So it became a family joke. Oh, Eric, you're waking up, it's 1111. You know, uh, my dorm room was 11. My birthday is 22. And it was throughout my whole life that I saw this. And then it was finally decades later where I started meeting people like Steve and meeting other spiritualists. And they started saying, no, 1111 is a sacred number. And it's, it's a reminder, it's a wake up call so that you can reclaim who you really are. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. Meaning I'm that special? And the person was like, yeah, you are that special. And so is everybody else. The 1111 was also an opportunity for me to start serving. Because ultimately, the gifts that we've been given are meant for others. You know, the Bible says you're not supposed to keep your light under a bushel. Don't hide your light. And so 11-11, whenever I see it, whenever I cross, come across the numbers, if I go to Starbucks, which is every two to three times a day, um, you know, it comes out to 11-11 on the receipt. So when I see it now, for me, it's, it's a remembrance. And I mention that to you because I'm certain that everybody here is being called. Everyone here is being summoned. And that there is a path for you and that you just have to fine-tune your antenna because the messages are coming God spirit consciousness calls to us 24 7 we're just not listening and so I would one of the first things I wanted was for you guys to start thinking what are the messages I'm getting are you getting messages from loved ones that have passed we have brother Vito here who's a medium and, you know, he's got a lot more experience in that field. But these things happen. The subtle realm is always trying to communicate with us. And I think groups like this help cultivate the antenna so that we can start hearing that. So I went through my childhood um, being a somewhat s secretly spiritual child. Um, you know, it wasn't cool playing hockey and, you know, blessing people, you know, <laughs> after they scored a goal on you. I forgive you, you know. <laughs> wasn't cool and I wanted to be cool you know no joke I really did want to be cool it was important to me to be a cool guy um, then high school and college and I lost it for a while you know every artist has their period you know Pablo Picasso had his blue years and things like that and so I had my what I call my beer and broads years and it was essentially, and I don't mean the word broads derogatorily, ladies, don't jump me after the performance. Um, it just it alliterates with the bees, so I thought it would be clever, right? But I was chasing girls, um, not catching them all the time, I'll admit, but sometimes. And I was just partying and drinking. And when I think back, I think part of it was because I, I guess I still needed to feel that connection. But the older I got, the world started to become too much with me. And I felt inadequate and I felt awkward believing what I believed and feeling what I felt but with no foundation upon which to base it so interestingly there were two instances in college three actually that kind of reminded me so that I wouldn't completely forget who I was and what my mission was in this life and one came that in my fraternity uh, they had offices and president vice president and secretary and all these other things and my fraternity nominated me to be the fraternity chaplain which means I would be there to assist any brothers with any spiritual matters, any psychological issues. If there were going to be any ceremonies, I would have to plan them out. And I hadn't thought about those things in years. And when they did that, I was like, ooh, that feels kind of familiar. I'm supposed to be doing stuff like this. But, you know, then beer pong came again, and I, you know, I quickly <laughs> forgot all over again. And then there was an instance where 
I came home uh, late one night to my apartment in college and had had lots and lots of drinks and was three sheets to the wind and I went and I turned on the TV and it was December and I was feeling melancholy. I was feeling a little bit lost without saying those words. And I put it on the TV and there is It's a Wonderful Life. And I wonder if, how many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life. If you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, don't watch it before Thanksgiving. You can watch it from Thanksgiving to Christmas after that. Don't do it. It's not right. It's sacrilege. Okay? You gotta wait until after Thanksgiving. That's Christmas season. But if you watch It's a Wonderful Life, it's really a beautiful story about sacrifice and about living for others. And that the really the wealthiest person in the world is the one who has the most <coughs> love in their hearts and who shares it with others. And I remember breaking down. Thank God I was alone in my apartment because I just let the waterworks go and I had no idea why I was crying except that there was I felt connected again I felt alive for one more second and then of course forgot so now years later I'm in a friend's apartment I just started teaching this is my 23rd year teaching in Central Isaac High School I just started teaching and I'm in my friend's room and he's got a little book on a makeshift table it's like a milk crate right like a college dorm and he has a book on it and it's one of those little books you find in Barnes and Noble that is on a little spinning shelf and they're little tiny travel books and it was called the little Zen companion and what it was it was a book filled with quotes paradoxes uh, koans which are like kind of Buddhist riddles and they're meant to exercise the brain and to enlighten the spirit so I picked it up and I started looking at it I was like whoa Bing, bell went off. Turned the page, read another one. Bing, another bell went off. I was like, oh my God. I was like, bro, what is this? He's like, word. I was like, yeah, word, bro. I said, this is, this is amazing. He goes, you think that's something? So he goes and he gets a tape cassette. It was a tape cassette back in the day. He puts it in, pushes play. And there is, for the first time I heard, Deepak Chopra's voice reciting chapters from the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita is a perennial book of wisdom from India. Um, it's a book of meditation. It's a book that Albert Einstein read regularly, great mind of his own. And Einstein himself said that this book was the highest region of thought he'd ever entered. And that in a hundred years, perhaps, quantum physics would begin to scratch the surface of what this book had already exercised and disposed of. Um, I've read the book hundreds of times. It, it, it's, it's still way beyond me. I get snippets, it's, and it's short. Um, at the center, I was able to do a three-week program teaching it. We're going to run it again at some point. But that was the changing point of my life. Because when I heard those verses of the Bhagavad Gita, and Bhagavad Gita translated in Sanskrit, from Sanskrit means the song of God or the song of the soul. It was from that moment on that I knew 